And I've actually pulled up a lot of your credits for these voices, and I'm just going to list them off right here. Uh, Tweety, uh, Barnyard uh -huh. Dog, Alley Cat. Uh, I'm hearing the voices as you call them out. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? Let, let's do this. Okay, uh, Tweety. Ooh, I taught my top putty tag. <laughs> I didn't I see a putty tag. <laughs> they pitch that up and it gets even more inhuman. I don't see <laughs> Sylvester on here. Can can you do Sylvester? Oh, I'm going to eat that darn bird if it's the last thing I do. I'm starving. Wow. A amazing, man. I'm in awe right now. I'm in awe. You have uh, uh, Barnyard Dog. What's, what's Barnyard Dog? All right. Look. I'm not a chicken. I'm a dog, okay? That sign on my house says D-O-G. Yeah, he was, he was the dog that I say, fo I say Foghorn Leghorn would always say, hey, you want, you want, a, you want a chicken, don't you? Why don't you go over that, that, that little house there that says D-O-G? That's a chicken, boy. Go get him. Yeah, he's, he was like, he was the nemesis uh, or the adversary of Foghorn. So... You would have the <laughs> just poor <laughs> the, the Looney Tunes only wanted to bug the crap out of each other. I don't know why, but uh, you know they would always be at each other's throats for no good reason other than to make us laugh. Yeah, and that's in Barnyard Dog was the dog that uh, Foghorn, Foghorn Leghorn. He's always lifting his ass up and and, and, and yeah. whipping it. Yeah, you know that's the, <laughs> I love that. Hey everybody, how you doing? Corey here in the middle of the day. You know, I do all my stuff at night. So if I'm doing something in the middle of the day, then I'm stopping the middle of my day for somebody very special. And we do have someone that I am a big fan of. I'm a big fan of his work. This is my first time actually meeting this person. And it is a great pleasure to talk to another voice actor who has lent his voice to some characters that I know you have grown up with, and I definitely have grown up with, and he's helping to carry the legacy of those characters on. Please welcome Mr. Eric Bowser. Eh, what's up, Corey? I'm <laughs> ready to get double toasted. <laughs> I was hoping that you would do some voices, man. I'm not going to lie. I never ask a voice actor to do the characters, but when they do, it just sends me chills, man. You know, it's a it's a superpower that I can't hide. So uh, if if it makes you laugh, if it, it brings smiles to people's faces, I'm gonna do it. Well, you see me smiling right now. You know, that's the that's the only bad thing about starting out with these voices that I just get all giddy and I start giggling and everything. <laughs> so, you know, man. I mean, that's that's what that's what the people are clicking on this video for. That's what they're watching. They don't want to hear this voice. They want to hear from Daffy Duck, okay? The real <laughs> star of Looney Tunes. Let's just. Let's just get that fact out of the way. <laughs> These are genuine laughs that you're getting from me, man. You know, uh, and it's just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting up here and I'm getting chills just listening to the voice. For you to be able to do those voices, you know, the, the, the actual character, how is that for you? Well, it's still, like, surreal. I think any time I step into uh, the booth, into these roles... You know, it just brings me back to my childhood with these characters. And that was, I'm sure you, you understand what I'm saying by Saturday morning cartoons. That was the only time uh, our generation or, you know, generations in the 80s and 90s could get kids entertainment. Now, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> any reflective <laughs> surface is premiering a new uh, six season episode of something. You know, it's nonstop. But uh, back then... I think it's something that uh, used to bring us in together as a, as an audience. You know, we could all experience this at the same time and sit through the same uh, uh, commercials that were trying to sell you toys. Uh, and uh, it was, there was something great about it and magical. And the funny thing is, is that, again, these, at least for Looney Tunes, uh, they weren't necessarily made for kids. They were more like throwaway cartoons in the 40s for theaters before feature films yeah and someone had the right mind to put them in syndication and package them as a show and that's kind of how i got introduced to the characters and uh you know how i learned to draw and then uh, before i was a voiceover artist i was a character layout artist and then that got me into voiceover but you know i owe it to the looney tunes i always say if it weren't for mel blank uh I'd probably be driving you to the airport in my Uber. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, you know, he would, he it's would just... be the most entertaining Uber driver, though, if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean uh, yeah I mean again anywhere a, a conversation can be had I'm always, someone is always uh you know I I I often when I travel I'll have like a Looney Tunes backpack that has the characters on it and people always ask about it or they you know and then I and then I let the I let the rabbit out of the bag or the cat the cat out of the bag uh, yeah <laughs> so yeah it's it's funny uh it, it I'll never get used to it because because i'm such a I, i'm a fan first uh of these characters and again i just hope I, I i'm 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 carrying the characters to the next generation and then someone else will step into uh in, into these rabbit feet <laughs> you know you are not just a looney tunes fan you're a looney tunes fanatic you i'm looking <laughs> at you i'm looking at young eric right here you got the yes. Bugs buddy shirt on even back in the day that was uh, taken last week. Uh, <laughs> you know, Filipinos and their uh, their magical genes. But you know, what? Once I turn sixty five, I just turn into Yoda. Uh, that's the <laughs> and you'll be doing the, the voice part. then. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, again, what, uh, as long as I'm able to uh, sit up and speak into a microphone, then I guess I have nothing to worry about. But yeah, that was actually one of the first trips I ever took to Los Angeles uh, is, is when I went to Six Flags Magic Mountain and I bought that shirt because I was completely, completely blown away at the fact that they had this entire section of the park dedicated to Looney Tunes and, of course, the DC characters as well. But yeah. uh, I was just like, I need that shirt. It's the tackiest. I still have that shirt, by the way. And uh, that is the eighth grade uh, photo, like class or a student photo, like picture day. And uh, <laughs> people were like, why are, are you wearing your pajamas to school? People thought, <laughs> I'm like, no, no, this this is an adult, like it's got buttons, like this is an adult garment. Um, but that just goes to show, like, look, I, I would own, like I made this shirt, by the way. I didn't, I didn't buy this one. This is a one of one. But uh, uh, I would own these shirts, even if I weren't uh, the, the, the voices of these characters. Yeah, you know, you uh, you do those voices so well. I want to actually show a clip of uh, you doing Bugs Bunny and some other voices. Marvin the Martian. I mean, you've done, you'd, I'm going to ask you in a little bit how many of these characters that you do, but this is a clip, as I said, with you doing Bugs Bunny and Marvin the Martian so people can actually see you. You know, they've already heard it, but they can see you doing the actual character. You're going to have me run all your Martian errands? That's right. Oh! You're gonna make me clean that filthy ray gun of yours? Yes, and I'll have you do so right now. Okay, okay, I got this. A quick polish ought to do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do those voices so well. I mean, you cannot tell the difference between you and the legendary Mel Blanc. And, uh, That's kind of you to say. Uh, well, uh, you, but you do those two characters, and then you just did Daffy a little while ago. I mean, you you pretty much do the whole catalog of characters, right? Uh, for the most part, uh, again, Mel Blanc was the original performer uh, and pretty much inventor and creator of of these personalities. You know, they're not just characters because they're definitely fleshed out, thought out like people. They feel like they're just like again, Bugs Bunny's eighty three now. I think eighty three, eighty four years old. So we kind of yeah. talk about him. We talk about him like our oldest relative. And uh, that's the scary part, I think, you know, when, when, when you, you give me such praise or accolades or recognition of, of the fact that I'm even coming that close to the sun, uh, it's scary because it's like, you know, a lot of people have memories tied to these characters. And aside from the fact you have to, I think the most important part about actually performing these characters is the good acting. You know, getting the voice print down obviously is like, you know, one of the main ingredients, but mm -hmm. you have to be somewhat of a good performer. I think this is just general advice too for anyone in voiceover. Uh, you know, whether it be legacy characters or original characters, you have to be a good performer, a good actor or actress to 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 really make you as a, a audience member care or feel about these characters like we used to when we were kids. You know, like I know it's a seven minute cartoon. But yeah, Marvin Marvin is trying to kill everyone on earth. So like, you know, we we have to we got to root for the root for the rabbit, Doc. I got to <laughs> save you guys. So <laughs> it, 
I don't know. There, again, it's 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 good acting, and then having I think a good ear, like a, for musicality, uh, because again, Mel Blanc, uh, he had such range, and also because he was originating the characters, he could do anything he wanted with the characters. He could go. Uh, my favorite part about Bugs Bunny is that he didn't always sound. Like that nasally kind of rabbit that we all remember. Yeah. Like uh, anytime he got out of that box, like, uh, oh, I'm dying. Like when he would do stuff like that, you know, that's the kind of thing as a performer or as a as a voice match to Bugs. That That's kind of what I wanted to bring back was that territory of of being so unhinged that you're not even in the character voice. Yeah. And for those who don't no Mel Blanc. He, I mean, a lot of young people out there today, you'd be surprised, and it kind of hurts to hear that now, but some people don't know who Mel Blanc is at the moment, and he's the one that is the originator of many of these voices that you hear for these characters. And I've actually pulled up a lot of your credits for these voices, and I'm just going to list them off right here. Uh, Tweety, uh, Barnyard uh -huh. Dog, Alley Cat, uh, I'm Charlie. doing the voices as you call them out. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? Let, let's do this. Okay, uh, Tweety. Ooh, I taught I taught a putty tag. <laughs> I didn't I see a putty tag. <laughs> they uh, pitch that up and it gets even more inhuman. I don't see Sylvester on here. Can can you do Sylvester? Oh, I'm going to eat that darn bird if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> I'm starving. Wow. A amazing, man. I'm in awe right now. I'm in awe. You have uh, uh, Barnyard Dog. What's, what's Barnyard Dog? All right. Look, I'm not a chicken. I'm a dog, okay? That sign on my house says D-O-G. Yeah, he was, he was the dog that I say, I say Foghorn Leghorn would always say, hey, you want, you, want a, you want a chicken, don't you? Why don't you go over that, that, that little house there that says D-O-G? That's a chicken, boy. Go get him. Yeah, he's... He was like, he was the nemesis uh, or the adversary of Foghorn. So you would have the, <laughs> just poor, <laughs> the, the Looney Tunes only wanted to bug the crap out of each other. I don't know why, but, uh, you know, they would always be at each other's throats for no good reason other than to make us laugh. Yeah, and, that, and Barnyard Dog was the dog that... Uh... Foghorn, Foghorn Leghorn, he's always lifting his ass up and, 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 and yeah. whipping it. Yeah, you know, that's the, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, his, there he is right there, Barnyard Dog, for those who uh, remember Looney yeah. Tunes. And Almost Hoover's like uh, a voice not to, I mean, it, it doesn't actually, Mel Blanc's natural speaking voice is a, a bit warmer, and then he puts a little bit of an edge to it and suddenly it becomes like this, uh, yeah, Barnyard Dog, that's all it is. All oh, right, yeah. Rooster. Yeah, he just like that kind of generic sounding voice. You're a genius. You are, you are a genius. You know. What I, I just think I'm a guy that has a lot of time on his hands. You, that's all. You a guy that has a lot of talent inside him is what you have. That's it's. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm blown away. You, you, you have nailed all these voices. I mean, I'm just closing my eyes right now. I don't even see you anymore. <laughs> I see the characters. Um, you know, one of the things that you're here to promote, actually, because. You're so talented that you don't only do Looney Tunes characters. There's a new Woody Woodpecker movie that's going to be coming out on Netflix. That's correct. Uh, actually, it drops tomorrow um, on Netflix. And this, I guess, I'm not sure if it's a direct sequel to the first one that dropped, like, I think it was, like, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it's like another one of those, like, you know, if, if we were living, like, in the 80s or 90s or even early 2000s, not necessarily meant for theaters, but more of like a direct to home release. So, yeah. of course, you know you got to work with the budget that you're given, and and you know it, again, it's 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 no knock on the movie itself. It's just you know it's it's crazy to see these like two hundred million dollar movies like you know tank at the box office, and then like this you know I don't know barely you know tens of millions of dollars to, and that even to me sounds like a lot of money. Uh, to make a movie like this, and people just watch it over and over and over and over again. Kids, you know, this is truly the the, the meaning of a uh, children's movie. It's so for for families to enjoy, and there's just not there's there's the the only pressure is that j just to entertain the kids and and to make sure like you know we we see Woody now. I, I love this. It, he's he's battling now. Buzz Buzzard and Wally Walrus uh, have been. <laughs> 
included in in the in the picture. So it really does feel like you're watching an old Woody Woodpecker cartoon. And again, um, for 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 the the cast and crew that worked on the first one and the cast and crew of this one, they just happened to find the right people to to make these movies a, as they are. And I think it's just gonna entertain people, serve its purpose, and hopefully we get to make another one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know. It's, I was watching this, and you're right. I, I mean, I don't think you're being down on the movie, but, I mean, you're definitely, you should play it up a little bit more because, I mean, it's listen, it's Netflix, and we're in a different time. It, like you said, maybe this would have gone to a, a bargain bin, a, a home straight to video or something, but it's Netflix has money. Netflix knows, you know, that they, they put these things on that people watch over and over again. And uh, yeah. I think that says something about this. I mean, and, and even I being an adult who remembers Woody Woodpecker from back in the day, I was actually, I'm going to show a clip of this right now so people can hear your voice work for Woody Woodpecker. Okay, uh, I just, I, I thought it was kind of impressive how they brought in some of the uh, the side characters, the supporting characters, and put in here. Yeah. We're going to train like nobody's watching. Because we'd be embarrassed if someone was watching. Last thing I need is a loudmouth Woodpecker spoiling my plan. So it really is very much like a old Woody Woodpecker cartoon. It basically, yeah. I mean, look at it. It's just, it's set up exactly like the visual gags. That's exactly what would have happened in like an actual cartoon. Like slapstick humor. Here's your zany character. And then you throw in some kids. And I feel like it kind of, it kind of makes sense too. Of course, we're, we're at a, at a summer camp, of course, in the woods. And who else would you find in the woods than Woody Woodpecker? So yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that there was a, a screenwriter at the Oscars that that said, "Yeah, let's let's instead of making one billion dollar movie, let's make, you know, a bunch of like less expensive films." And I feel like I I would love to see like more of these, you know, come out because they're they're great stories, they're simple stories. It just it's just entertainment, you know. We don't have to try so hard here. Just just let it be what it is, and let the Woody Woodpecker fans find it. And uh, I think that's what this is going to do. I think because there was a surge, by the way, in the first one, they mm -hmm. that, that one kind of came and went. And then years later, it for whatever reason, I think it was like just last year, it was the number one movie all summer. Like, I think when the kids came, went out of school, people found it. And uh, for whatever reason, the the almighty algorithm just decided to put it in first place. And that lasted for quite some time. So... Uh, and we had already started making this. Maybe maybe it's more than just what's current, the algorithm at Netflix. Maybe they, they can predict the future. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, it kind of comes at a good time for them to release this because people were, as soon as this trailer dropped, people were very excited for it. Well, you know, I think you make a great point about making stuff on a lower budget and and you know and it's just great business to do that because uh, i mean i don't know you've worked in the business a long time there is a lot of bloat with hollywood budgets out there we see it with, absolutely yeah we see it with the uh, movies and now we see it with video games you know in video games they have these independent uh people coming out and making very entertaining games and they're recouping their money back these big games can't recoup their money back you know and you see yeah, this with movies. I, I, i'm so I'm, you, you, yeah, I'm so surprised uh, at that now because video games, I remember the turning point where it was, uh, I was still working in animation as, as an artist uh, and I remember seeing the trades coming in and it was the same weekend that I think uh, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 uh, and then uh, I don't know which Grand Theft Auto came out, but they, they kind of were released on the same weekend and video games just completely dominated uh, this movie, you know, we were so used to, it was the era of movies opening to two hundred million dollars or a hundred million dollars opening weekend or whatever. And now, mm -hmm. you know, we 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 can only hope we could get back to those numbers. But I remember that turning point for video games because I remember the voice actors or the performers in that Grand Theft Auto being very, you know, uh, upset by like, oh man, we only made that much. You know, they they made a handsome payday, I'm sure, but like in the grand picture, in the grand scale. Like, man, we're talking like mil hundreds of millions, maybe even close to now billions. But now we're in that era of maybe we're experiencing video game fatigue, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I just, like I said, people are just spending 
you see where a certain form of media becomes so popular and then people just spend and spend and spend and then it's hard for them to get their money back but you know yeah. think with things like horror movies are you know with something like netflix doing a woody woodpecker movie you know that's just great yeah. business because you know people are going to watch this over and over again uh it's not a huge huge budget but and you're going to get your money back so you know I yeah think exactly smart. look you're 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 not you know hey uh, I don't know if you can see but I'm not Chris Pratt uh, but uh, <laughs> you know I, 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 get the, I get the job done and and look one of the uh, the performers in this I think she's the main girl the main young lady uh, 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 she had reached out to me uh, you know I'd never met any of these folks I think most of this was filmed in Vancouver uh, Canada and you know, being a fellow Canadian, it was it was nice to chat with someone that's on the movie because they were acting to my performance, I guess, on set. And look, this is going to launch someone's career. She's going to have a great, you know, hopefully like a good a good career after this goes. She she's already working on more stuff, and it 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 cost them like less than uh, I'm sure any A list celebrity <laughs> that had this all like like the the. The, the salary of an A-list celebrity probably covered the cost of the whole movie. Uh, and, and, you know, and here we are, you know, I, I just hope that it does well. Yeah. Because uh, it, it's always not, you know, I, I won't be the last person to do these characters, but I just want there to be more opportunities for people to work on more uh, animated, you know, whether they be fully animated or hybrid. I would love to see a fully animated Woody Woodpecker movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Me, wishful thinking it would be in 2d i think i think that people i mean cg is amazing uh, look at this movie it's gorgeous but i i still miss those days of like man like even like lion king or like you know th those like hand-drawn feature films there's something that is so tangible about them uh that you can't really you could achieve great things with cg but not like i don't know there's there's something about you could really feel the time an effort that went into a hand-drawn movie. Yeah, yeah, our show or anything. You know, and I guess you probably feel like that because I found it interesting that you, I guess you got your start, I'm guessing you got your start at Spumco. Uh, of course, yeah. that's the studio that created Ren and Stimpy, and that's uh, the studio created by the now infamous uh, John Crick <laughs> Uh You know, I mean, you know, saying yeah. it like it is. The best part about you know that was actually my college internship back in 1999. You know, I'm dating myself now, but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, that was a, a show that came out in the 90s, and I think we're about to enter that same kind of creator-driven artist renaissance with the overload of reboots and remakes. Again, I'm guilty. I'm part of all of it. You know, and I love I love giving back to these characters that inspired me to be an artist, but at the same time. Uh, we should all be inspired or strive to, you know, knock it out of the park with the original stories and content. Uh, as much as I love to, you know, my magic trick of uh, turning into these characters, you know, I'd love to have that one iconic character that I created that, who knows, another <laughs> another kid from Toronto would take over later. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, with, with, with Ren and Stimpy and Spumco, my experience there was like, you know, in an, in an internship, you learn what to do and you you learn what not to do. And uh, what I learned is that you got to treat people re with respect and you got to be nice, no matter how talented you are. The people that always get the jobs uh, or who who gets called back to play in the playground are the people that play nice. So mm -hmm. you got to you got to treat people with respect. And uh, not everything's going to be perfect. Not everything's going to be you know, go your your way. And and that's all right. You know, like. The, the quest at that studio was always to make like the most immaculate art and the most immaculate uh, 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 episodes or work, but to the point of the sanity of, uh, of a lot of these <laughs> artists. You know? uh, they said if you could survive working there, then you could, you could work anywhere. But uh, yeah, I remember leaving that studio and then, and then going to another studio and they're like, hey, hey, did you know that they give you uh, bagels every Friday here? It's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you but know, something, so, go something ahead. so simple like that, you know. Yeah, no, I understand exactly what you mean, and, and especially when you talk about being nice. I mean, a lot of us learn that the hard way sometimes. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think that's, when we talk about you being just multi-talented, 
you know, not you, you know, you, your your talent extends beyond voice work. You are also an artist. Uh, when you were at Spunko or anywhere else, I know you said you did did you you did layouts, but did you do any yeah, anim- so did you do animation? Not not full animation, but like I my position is actually kind of a a a, a job in animation that kind of does unless you're working on a feature film doesn't really exist in TV animation anymore. If you look at uh, the animatics from like Family Guy. Uh, which are basically uh, the, the marriage of rough storyboards, so basically almost like comic book style, really rudimentary, uh, uh, non-finished drawings of, of these characters uh, mixed with uh, audio, uh, like music, sound effects, and some scratch or temporary dialogue in a small QuickTime video. That gets shipped overseas, and then they animate the episode from that blueprint. Uh the job that I used to have was character layout. So after someone would do a storyboard of a scene, like say Bugs Bunny pops out of a rabbit hole and starts chewing on a carrot and goes, "Mm, what's up, Jack? I would uh, take those rough drawings and I would draw the final poses of Bugs Bunny with the carrot. And then I would give that to the animator and they would make those poses move. You know, it's funny because you and I have a lot in common in the, in this area. Uh, you did layout for an animation studio, and you also loved Space Jam. When you were a kid, you grew up with Space Jam. You loved <laughs> Space Jam, from what I understand, from what I read, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, I also, at one time, used to work at an animation studio, and I had the privilege of working on what some people called the greatest shadow in animation history. I did the shadow for this iron lung for... <laughs> No I, did, I just did the shadow for this iron lung for uh, Tweety Bird and <laughs> Space Jam. Um, I, I was not a very good artist. They kept me away from that movie. But one day, they, they, that's, the studio I worked at got effects animation work for Space Jam. And they were yeah. in such a crunch that they said, okay, you cannot possibly screw up making a shadow. <laughs> so they gave me the shadow right here to draw. Look. Look, you you made it to the big screen in one of the greatest films ever made. <laughs> I got my name on it just for drawing one shadow. So you know, oh, they yeah. give me credit. They had to put me on there. <laughs> See, this is this is what I mean. I feel like I've cracked the code to the matrix. This is what my life has led myself up to. Is this moment right now talking to you on your show? Because like I watched the shit, the shit, the, the shit out of that movie. I know you can bleep it out later, but <laughs> uh, like seriously, I I I was in. It was nineteen ninety six. Right, 1996, 1997. So that movie was based off of two Super Bowl commercials. Uh, 1992 was Air and Hair Jordan, and it was uh, Bugs Bunny. uh, What's with all the racket? Can can a rabbit get me sleep around here? Like, and and there were there, there were these bullies playing basketball. You know, and he's underground, and then Bugs uh Bugs Bunny is helped by Michael Jordan. Uh, that spot on the Super Bowl uh, was so popular. Two years later, they made another one called Aerospace Jordan. And it was, uh, oh goody, I am going to steal all the Air Jordans on Earth. So Marvin Mar- Marvin the Martian steals all the Air Jordans. And of course, Bugs Bunny and Michael Jordan come to the rescue. And then two years after is when Space Jam happened because of those, uh, I mean, that campaign was just a juggernaut and uh, now we know who did the shadow of the Iron Lung for Tweety. There, there you go, man. It all it all comes full circle for us right here. Oh, my poor little queen. <laughs> it's even better when you put a voice to that shadow, man. Now, now my life is complete. <laughs> but, you know. The credits are rolling right here. Yeah, this is where the credits roll. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, we just freeze frame and the credits roll. But, you know, man, I... I, again, I'm so amazed at how you have nailed these voices. So what was the process leading up to that? I mean, are you just, like I said, are you just a genius at doing the voices or were you in the mirror, you know, every day for years practicing these voices? Yeah, it's kind of strange. I mean, I would say we all have that, If you, if, especially if you're an artist or, uh, you know, love love cartoons. I feel like when you're a kid, you just sound like a kid trying to do voices at best. You could maybe get the rhythm. Uh, you might make your parents laugh. You might make your cousins laugh or your friends in high school laugh. Uh, yeah, I think it was it was high school is when it took the turn. You know, you're 
your voice starts changing. You you have fur where you didn't have fur before. You know, <laughs> I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the Phil the Phil I'm doing the Phil Hartman voice from The Simpsons. You know, uh, when he was going through the puberty uh, thing. But yeah, it's like. I remember being the class clown and uh, the teachers would be like, ha ha, very funny. Okay, do your work. They, they would never stop me from being creative. They, they would actually barter. They would work out a deal where uh, if I did my work in on time and got good grades, then I could start doing the morning announcements in, in the school. I would go to the main office in the morning and I would read any like anything special that was going on in the school. They would do the national anthem. I went to a Catholic school, so they might have done the the Lord's Prayer, and then uh, and then I would bust onto the microphone as Homer Simpson and go, "Ooh, Marge, hot dogs are on sale in the cafeteria." <laughs> And then I'd be like, oh, Homer, oh, Homer, hot dogs are bad for you. They're full of cholesterol. Yeah, so I would, I would you know, do these voices. And then um, the, the more fuel for the fire would be I would walk down the hall and then other kids would be like, hey, was that you? And I was like, yeah. And they'd be like, that's awesome. And then I would, I would do it again until uh, I finally figured out a way to get paid for it. But, uh, but really, the, but, but the honing the voices was – you know, clearly I'm not an athlete. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, I don't go to the gym. My version of the gym is like watching one episode of Looney Tunes every you, day. You have nice arms. I'm going to tell you that right <laughs> now. You do. I'm looking at your arms. Well, well toned, well defined. Yeah, very nice arms. It's from opening up uh, jars of uh, Nutella and peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I got, guys. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I like to imagine that my throat has a six pack, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's it, it's insane how much you can just, you know, it's like knowing the lyrics and the beat of your favorite song is what I kind of equate it to when it comes to these characters. Uh, and I think maybe voice matching altogether, uh, I, you know, Bug, Bugs Bunny has that nasally kind of a quality to his voice and when you drop in that Brooklyn accent or the Bronx, you know, that it just becomes bugs. But in that same pitch and register, if you drop the accent and start talking like a baby, it just becomes Tweety. Mm. Uh, Sylvester sounds like, uh, you know, he was described by Mel Blanc as a, a big floppy cat that is going to eat that yellow bird. Uh, if, if you switch the personality to being a bit more greedy and self-centered... Like, I'm the star. I'm the one that's going to be uh, the, the lead in the next motion picture. You take that voice, and what they did was they pitched him up, Mel Blanc, and it became Daffy. Daffy is just Sylvester pitched up. Wow. I, you know, I, I could I, see that. I never thought about yeah, that. It's, it's, it's very bizarre uh, that they, they thought it would be funnier to do that, just to differentiate the, the character sound. But it became its own thing. Uh, and... Yeah, thank thank God they did that. I mean, it's it, Daffy is such a. <laughs> I almost kind of like him better. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he's <laughs> Bugs is kind of like man the people the, the person that we want to be, but unfortunately, I think we're all just Daffy. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, I'm definitely well, Daffy. <laughs> I, I I I go on my phone and I see how many likes I have today. <laughs> you know, uh, I just want all the attention. Yeah, uh, that's Daffy. Uh, and then so on and so forth. I I, I always say, uh, you know, Pepe Le Pew lives in the basement not because he's canceled, but uh, you know, he's 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 in that the the basier region of Mel Blanc's uh, range. And uh, once you lose the French accent and start talking like you're from the the South, that becomes I say fog I say foghorn leghorn. Yeah. So, well, so uh, you really it, have found the connection between all the characters, and like you know, I never thought about how. Like how uh, Sylvester was, was was dappy, just you know pitched up. That's that's amazing. Yeah, and, and as the same goes for Porky. He's he's kind of in that uh, you know when I perform him, I'm in around that bu uh, be, be a bugs area. But then you have, have to add that stutter. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> in the I call it the house of Mel Blanc, and they all live on different floors. You know when you say you uh, how you pitch shift these characters, I was uh, listening to you. And I'm just taking this back to uh, Woody Woodpecker. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this again because I'm, 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 I'm listening to this, and you have such range with your voice, that you know, I had, I had, uh, I was wondering about 
how you did Woody Woodpecker. I'm gonna train like nobody's watching. Because we'd be embarrassed if someone was watching. You know, did they have to pitch shift your voice, or is that you naturally doing that? I I, I have approached, though, like, Tweety, Daffy, and Woody, uh, and maybe even when I get to play Porky, um, I, I kind of do, like, the self-pitching. Like, it, it kind of just comes, like, it naturally, you know, maybe maybe I should try to do what Mel did. It might even sound even closer if I approach it from a deeper mid-range than already like a falsetto high pitch range who knows what digital magic might happen there if i did try to do it but mm -hmm. it just it's more comfortable for me to, like even as woody i'm like already kind of there oh boy uh it, it's so cold today i'm gonna go skating on that frozen pond yeah it's in that area already and they don't have to do much mm -hmm. uh but for my audition for woody woodpecker I did some, uh, this is how much of a nerd I am, guys. If you didn't already think I was a big nerd, here's evidence, is that I went back all the years that anyone's ever performed Woody Woodpecker, including uh, Gracie Stafford, Gracie Waltz. That's uh, Walter Lance's wife ended up, I think she was the last person in the original run of, uh, of Woody Woodpecker to perform Woody. So one day I would love to see a woman take over the, the part. It would be very cool. Uh, but... I took all of their performances in Final Cut Pro and I pitched them down to hear what they sounded like normally without the the, the audio uh, effects and the affectation. I, I brought them all down to like their normal speaking voices to kind of try to, try to find a comfort zone for myself when I, I put in my audition. So mm -hmm. when I submitted my audition, I submitted what I sounded like without affecting it and then I submitted a take that had, like, the effects on it. So, yeah, uh, my favorite performance, I think, although the first person to perform Woody was Mel Blanc, uh, the majority, I think, of the shorts that we all watched uh, was uh, Ben Hardaway. He used to work on lots of classic cartoons in that era. And for whatever reason, back in the 40s, everyone kind of sounded like this. <laughs> they all kind of had that weird sound to their voice, yeah. I would like a malt, please, and uh, put some soda in there, would you? Uh, yeah, like it was this weird, stilted, but very clear uh, pronunciation and an enunciation with uh, with <laughs> everything they did, including perform cartoon characters. Uh, so definitely have to talk about this because one of the things that I can tell you this, one of the things you cannot do a voice for you know, I, I got you on this one. You cannot do you cannot do Wally Coyote because he has no voice. <laughs> <laughs> so there, you're not that talented. No, no, you know, with this uh with Wally Coyote, yeah. everyone has heard now the big controversy and the disappointment behind Coyote versus Acme being shelved and supposedly at this point not being released by Warner Brothers, even though people are talking about how great it is. Uh, it's, you've had some directors out there, the Daniels, who did uh, everything all at once, saying it was great. They had test screenings that were great. You've seen it and said it yeah. was great. So yeah. why would Warner Brothers, with something that is getting such positive word of mouth and such positive reactions, why would they want to shelve this movie right here? I mean, uh, I, I think there's, you know, uh, thank, thank you for bringing it up because I think it's something that needs to be talked about uh, in general um, for, for not just for the movie itself, but for the industry, the importance of storytelling, uh, you know, where, where we are at currently in, in today's industry financially. Uh, clearly, we're we're in, in trouble. You know, I, I think when when you have something on your hands that has the potential to go the distance, and and you're in such a a, a state, uh, you know, a ba bad shape or state that you you can't even afford to put it out, that just goes to show, like, yeah, this is the harsh side of of making art. There's still a commerce; it's still a business. Uh, you know, I can only owe it to, you know, putting up, making a movie is one thing, but also releasing it as another distribution, marketing, it's a whole different part, a whole different cost, a whole different uh, necessity. You, you kind of need to do that or else, like I'm doing the campaigning. They don't, even, they don't even have to spend a dime on the marketing. <laughs> I will put that, 
I will put that suit on and go out to Jiffy Lube and spin a sign. And, you know, uh, I mean, I, I might. I just might. Uh, is it four o'clock yet? I might be late for my shift. <laughs> yeah. You um, know, it, it, it is it is a sad part of the business yeah. that here we are. You know, we're 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 caught in the middle of it, and I keep hearing different things. I keep hearing that it's 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 buried like a bone in the backyard, or I, I heard that it's uh, still up for grabs, but. Again, uh, I, I don't even think that they're looking at the titles at this point when you're when you're crunching the numbers for a multi-billion dollar movie studio. You're probably only looking at not the titles, but the numbers that work in that spreadsheet that uh, gets you down yeah. to that level, right? You're not yeah. even looking at what it is. You're just looking up, uh, to keep your head above water. And, I, you know, I'll always joke about the subject uh because that's just who i am but i'll always preface the conversation with i'm not a ceo you know i'm just a wabbit you know uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh the the good part is is that since all of this news has kind of i feel i feel like it's simmered down a bit but people keep every now and then people just poke the the bear they poke the beast just to see if it's still awake uh but since since the news has kind of come and gone, I've already worked on a, a handful of new Looney Tunes projects, so they're not abandoning the Looney Tunes. Uh, not not quite yet, but and knock on wood, knock on uh, uh, studio foam that they never. <laughs> but uh, I feel like, you know, again, they're they're just kind of picking and choosing their battles, I guess. And unfortunately, we were one of the ones that had to kind of uh t- take take the bullet or, or or fall because of uh because of uh rabbit leaving duck season <laughs> <laughs> no sorry fellas it's tax season yeah. <laughs> you know um <laughs> i know you saw the movie and you and you said you loved it so i you know i know you can't really talk about it in full detail but yeah. you know, we've we've heard everybody say they love it, but we haven't really heard why from a lot of people. Uh, what is it uh, about the movie that that you think makes it so great? Well, I think it's because it's just a, and again, going back to Woody Woodpecker, it's a simple story. It it is about a character that we know and love, and his whole existence is to eat the Roadrunner, and he's never been able to get a square meal because the Acme <laughs> Corporation keeps sending him products that literally blow up. In his face, they blow up on his feet, they blow him to pieces. Uh, it never works for him, and that has been the entire lot in his life until he finds the help of a like basically like a strip mall uh, lawyer. Like you know, he'd be in between Menchie's and uh, Taco Bell or a Subway, uh, and uh, and he tries to get help from Will Forte, uh, and it's hysterical. Like I mean. He does not. Wiley, you, you did get me. Wiley Coyote does not talk in the film. Uh, however, I did voice about almost 10 characters in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, to, to see Will Forte, who is a genius comedian, basically carry this movie on his back because mm-hmm. he's talking to a character that, that can only scribble down on those cue cards, you know? <laughs> uh, Again, reading off of cue cards like on Saturday Night Live, he hasn't really left the show. You know, comedy will always follow Will Forte everywhere. But uh, yeah, it, it's kind of incredible. Uh, I I feel like it had no no real oh nostalgia or or a product or a celebrity like tied to it. It was just like good actors, a a, a lovable character that we all know, and it was just. A great story directed by Dave Green, who, who he did the uh, he did the second Ninja Turtles that actually had Bebop, Rocksteady and Krang in it with the shredder. Uh, and I was yeah. like, you know, as a kid, I'm like, this guy gets it. And then I never thought I would actually get to work with Dave. And he just he just killed it. He knew what he was doing. And uh, yeah. Uh, and then and then here we are in the eye of the of, of the tornado, the eye of the storm. And uh, it is the most talked about movie that no one's ever seen. And you know wh- whether that's the fate of it. I I I I was just talking to a New York Times reporter before this, 
who just wrote an article about it. And I just told him I never thought in a million years that I would be attached to something like as highly publicized as this. You know, I thought I was going to get in trouble for using a uh, Daffy Duck voice on the picket line during the Fagaptra strike. Uh, but, I, you know, I've been kind of like vocal about this, too. And the common thing that I always get asked by people is like, they call you? Is there any backlash? And I'm like, no, not really. I, I think it would be not in character for, like, say, Mickey Mouse to speak up against Disney. But in the history of Warner Brothers... We've all seen Daffy Duck get kicked out of the Werner Brothers lot for being obnoxious. We've all seen Porky Pig try to start a new career and rip up his contract with I think it's so in character for Warner Brothers Looney Tunes to kind of battle Warner Brothers <laughs> or, or satirically and uh, in jest. But, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's just, it, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 like, I like the situation and I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you know... Do you think that maybe Warner Brothers is now kind of enjoying the publicity and marketing that they get from the controversy and they're just waiting? Like now that it's building up momentum with people continuing to talk about it, they're holding back, letting it build up. And then at some point when the demand is there, then they'll release it. Here's the thing. And I mean, you, you may have nailed it on the head. Who knows? But uh, when something is written off for taxes, it's not completely... You know, it's not like they, they gather all the files and they put it in the trash and it's gone forever. They actually, you, you know, you could buy the movie back by just giving back the money that Uncle Sam gave back to you, you know, the 40% tax break. You can get the movie back just by forfeiting the cash that you got and a little bit of interest and the movie's yours again. So whether this current regime or, or, or people in charge uh, release it, or the next wave, you know, I think it, it stands to see a little bit of hope and, and I hope, uh, you know, a little bit of light of day. But, you know, again, I I, I, uh, I, I can't, until I see my name scroll on the screen <laughs> is, yeah. when I, is when I believe it ha actually happened. Because, uh, you know, that's just the way it is these days when it comes to these these big projects and, and uh, motion pictures. So we've gone over the Looney Tunes characters, you know, and, uh, you know, we've, we've been very nostalgic about it. I've been, again, amazed by the way you, 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 you nail the voices. Yeah, and, you know, uh, and, and during that time, I've also heard little spatterings of other voices thrown in there. You had Homer and Marge. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, and when you had Spumko, you even did voices over there. Now, now, I don't know if, you know, they're not characters that are as big as in Legendaries as the Looney Tune characters are Homer or Marge, but uh, you did do some voices for the Ripping Friends. Oh, <laughs> that was actually funny. That was actually even before the, they tried to do a Ren and Stimpy reboot that was not well received by uh, anyone. And, and listen, man, I remember that, and I gotta tell you, I was cringing the whole time. Not, not, not to, <laughs> not, a, not a, anything against your voice work, but I was like, wow, this is, this is just not Ren and Stimpy. That's the thing. It's like this is, this is what I think, you know, and this is what I know. It's like the original Ren and Stimpy, you know, even before the cancellations of people and and uh, you know the bad, the bad reboots at a time where, where you know that wasn't even. In demand to be honest and i'll tell you why I'll, I'll explain it all it's it's very funny and interesting to look back at it all you know the original 90s run of the first two seasons i think of brennan's they be are are the greatest ones that will you know i haven't watched them in a while actually maybe there's a little bit of ptsd there but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh cold shower uh, yeah uh you know i i grew up watching it i loved it it influenced me there's no denying that and as I got to know uh, the creator and like some of the original crew, you hear the stories about what they were going through in the 80s. And I, I feel like, again, it brings it back to what's happening now. It's like this, we're in the corporate world of animation and all we want to bank on are the things we know that work. So it's all the reboots and all the, the reboots on reboots on reboots on reboots mm -hmm. versus an original cartoon like Ren and Stimpy. It was the anti-80s toy selling cartoon mm -hmm. and that's why it did so great because it was so brand new and inventive and it was more about the laughs it wasn't trying to sell you toys or t-shirts it was just trying to make you laugh 
and that goes the same uh, for the same for the Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead, uh, you know, uh, Rugrats, a- a- any one of those great, you know, uh, Doug, any one of those like '90s uh, Disney, Nickelodeon, or wh- whatever cartoon. It was just to to, to be. It was like the the '90s Renaissance of animation. Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, uh, Cow and Chicken. You know, these were so unique and different and it's like i miss that era i miss and i feel like that's what we're about to enter is because when you go to a studio now you can't pitch like even a show like bluey right like the yeah, idea yeah. that this is a show that's teaching parents how to play with their kids like it, it took bluey to be a success outside of the system that we have now to be wanted by the system because that's all the system can afford to do now is want to acquire the views like uh, baby shark. Uh, it, like that's, that was a song on, on YouTube, you know, a very popular song that everyone sang. I have an eight year old. I sang it to my eight year old son and it got turned into a series and then a movie, you know, but because it was a huge hit outside of the system is, is why it now exists on terrestrial television. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I want to play some of what you did here on Ripping Friends. I, you know, I, 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 you know, to work with all these, 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 this, these, 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 these properties, these characters, these IPs that have just been heavily, you know, not only cemented in pop culture but had just such an impact and influence. You know, you've you've been a part of some major history. Uh, yeah. You know, when I when I when I when I look at uh, what you did here with. Uh, with Spumco, you know, I imagine that you were an artist. Let me go ahead and play the clip here. This is you as a cat. It's actually pretty funny. I think you're this cat, and there's this joke about nature calling. And, and, and if you know Spumco or John Kay's humor or Rin and Stimpy humor, then you'll understand what they're doing here. <laughs> Hold on. I'm afraid nature is calling. I've heard that before telepathy. We used to have to do that manually. <laughs> so, you know, you did oh, that voice that, there. So were you... Cannot, was by that? the way, you get, you get the gold medal, by the way, for the most obscure... Like, how you were even able to find that clip. Like, you win, by the way, all the interviews. Uh, no one's ever brought up Future Cat in my, in my, in my history of interviews ever. That was the basically the first real character that I voiced right there, and that scene, by the way, where he's trying to, where he's trying to pinch one out, uh, and he's pounding <laughs> on, pounding on the desk. I I drew those poses. Oh, you did. Yeah. So the thing about Spumco is that I started out as a production assistant, uh, and then the the studio therapist. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no. Um, production assistant. So I was answering phones photocopies, all that good stuff. And then anytime the studio would run out of money, I would become that, that, that department. So like I would actually learn, and it was a great way to learn, uh, but it was like being a, <laughs> it was like being an editor on the Titanic, you know, like, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I learned how to edit animatics. I learned how to do sound effects. I learned how to do, temporary scratch dialogue which led into a voiceover career that that's a drawing that i did that's uh, a drawing you did right there nice right there that i oh i own that entire i i have it in a folder somewhere that entire series of poses i'll, I'll send it to you so you could post it when we're done but uh yeah it was it was a, a weird time and then after the ripping friends was that random stimpy reboot and i'll tell you why that was such a weird time anyways and why it was not a success. And it, it was because I feel like we had kind of fallen out of like, okay, 90s gross out humor with animation kind of came and went. Now we're in the era of jackass. And I'm mm. like, do I want to see Stimpy fart in someone's face or Steve-O fart in someone's face? I want to see Steve-O <laughs> do that. You know, we had humans being red and Stimpy. And I feel I feel like the other side of, of that, you know, adult party cartoon was uh, you took away the censor. You took away mm-hmm. the hurdles that often make you be be more creative and more devious to try to slip one past the man 
rather than, okay, all bets are off and here we go. Like, I think the reason why, again, the original was a, a complete success is because you had the 90s renaissance of these like-minded artists that wanted to prove that, like, you don't need to sell something to make a good show. But then you also took away the censors that I think kind of have to be there to kind of make you think of other clever ways to be <laughs> gross and vulgar. Yeah, no, man, you, you you nailed it right there. I keep saying you nailed, you nailed everything, damn. You know, you nailed the voices, you nailed points. Uh, you know, the no, you, you really, you hit it right there, though, because I think that that was what was so fun about Ren and Stimpy. Ren and Stimpy was a cartoon that was always skirting, you know, that line of being oh, yeah. mature humor, adult humor. It was it was something that the kids were watching and the kids were watching because we felt like they were getting away with something. And the adults yes. watched it because we got what they were saying. You know, when right. you when, when you put it on, uh, uh, what was it, Spike TV or whatever, and they just were free to just do all kind of dirty humor, it really missed the point. Yeah, it, it, again, you, again, going back to like, why, again, it, it, think about this. Uh, Spike TV, like they had not just, you know, 18 and up Ren and Stimpy, they had Pam Anderson's uh, Stripperella and they had Kelsey Grammer's Gary the Rat. They had this weird block of adult cartoons that like kind of d didn't really, no one was really clamoring for like Adult Swim yet, right? Yeah. I mean, unless I'm wrong, I can't even really think of, you know, maybe uh, was it Liqu Liquid Television or whatever, like, the, you know, a little bit of yeah. Aeon Flux possibly. But that was like really like mature. It wasn't like, you know, Aqua Teen or or you know Rick and Morty yet. It, it you know, it was kind of like in this like gray area of animation where it's like, hey, look at this. It's it's adult cartoons and people are like, eh, you know, like I'll watch Akira if I want adult cartoons. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, there there's like a lot of weird things. I think you could watch it now with the volume off and just kind of enjoy like the art. Because again, there were some really uh, talented, talented people that worked on that. Nick Cross, Christy Gordon, uh, you know, you got Mike Kerr. This is like a lot of Canadians. A lot of Canadians, eh? So speak slow so we can understand <laughs> what you, the Americans are talking about, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there was a great group of, of artists here in the U.S., you know, like Katie Rice, uh, we got Fred Osmond, Ray Morelli, uh, you know, Matt Tanner. We, we had a lot of really great, uh, Gabe Soir, a lot of Tony Mora, man, all the, these are all the people that I met in 1999 that are still dear friends of mine. And they survived the Spumco, uh, you know, boot camp, uh, as, as some of the Canadians did and, and went on to good things. But, uh, that was the one thing you, you could say about that studio is that it did attract uh, a lot of really good, talented, yeah. talented folks. Last question here. I mean, you, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you, man, this has been great. You've given so much more insight to this conversation you, than I imagine. You're the only person that has asked for these these uh, really, uh, you know, really deep, uh, deep-rooted questions in my <laughs> career, like the, the dark early ages of my <laughs> career. And I also have to, I would love to sit up here and take credit for it, but I have to give credit to uh, my production assistant, uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin King, he's the one that found this clip and did a lot of research. So, you know, that needs to go on a shirt. That, that does. I, I love that. I love this old clip, man. I actually remember this. I used to watch everything Spump go back in the day. Uh, uh, John K, man, uh, until he was kind of a dick about something. But not, not besides the obvious one, but no, it was something <laughs> later on that he did, or something earlier, way earlier that he did before that. But anyway. Maybe. Uh, yeah, still, oh still, still a huge. <laughs> I was, I'm, you know, I love, but all the artists that did all this, I'm still a huge fan of everyone that worked on this. Just like you were giving credit to them uh, just now. But last question here. So, to say that your IMDb page is extensive, <laughs> that's you know that's putting it very lightly. You know, I'm looking at everything that you've done here and all of the voice work that you've done. I mean, the list just keeps going and going and going. And a lot of it, if not all of it, looks to be voice work. But you have a, you know, you have an awesome personality. You, you know, you, you're, you're very outgoing. You, 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 I mean, you're in front of a camera right now and you really know how to work. You, you, re, you know how to perform. You're a great performer. Oh. And, you, and, and you're not in cartoon form right now. So, you know, would, do, have you done or do you have any desire to do live action acting? 
Well, if you if I could give you the 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 Vimeo links and the code, I'll, I'll send them to you. I I had a very short uh, run hosting a a show in Canada that was basically my own show uh, with the Fathom Film Group. The ladies over at Fathom Film Group produced one hell of a show called Stay Tuned, where I interview some pretty iconic uh, actors and voiceover actors and professionals, uh, professors, doctors, uh, old time animators about animation, not a nostalgia show per se, but what was really going on like LGBTQ plus issues, racism in cartoons. Uh, we had commercialism, capitalism. We had, uh, you know, just subliminal messages. Uh, we had the, the, the soft look, like what was, you know, jokingly, like what, what, what turned you on about the cartoons, why you liked them. Then we had the professional take on it. And then the third guest in the show, this is like a 22 minute show, six episode miniseries. The third guest would give you the, the outlook and how it's changed and what we're striving for now. So it was a very interesting show and I had a great time uh, hosting it and, and being, I would interview much like how you're doing now. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't wake up thinking about that. I wake up thinking about, Oh boy, doc, I hope I'm not going to get shot by some hunter. You know, <laughs> I, I, that's where my brain ex- lands. You know, I've had other very amazing, famous, successful friends, Carlos Ellis Rocky, who of course is the voice of uh, Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life and Reno 911, you know, very prolific stand up comic, as well as, uh, you know, Harlan Williams. Hey there, buddy, you should do stand up. I was like, I got these like legendary stand up comics telling me I should do stand up. And all I keep thinking about is, oh, that's for the birds. I'm fine where I am. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I know where my place is in this world, and it's in this. Sherman Oaks bomb shelter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm this is this is my happy place. Well, I back those legendary icons and comedians and and uh, other people that say you could do that. You, I'm, you, at this point, you can do any damn thing you want to. You know, I believe you could do it. Uh, not, no problem well, at I, all. So you know, that's the, uh, awfully nice of you to say, and uh, I really appreciate. You know, I, when when I heard that you wanted to interview you wanted to interview me, I was like, okay. I've I've reached a different level here now. So uh... Man, he's lying his ass off right now. He didn't say that. But you're very kind also, and I appreciate it. And I really do appreciate you taking the time out to do this. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, you know, again, I'm a little biased because I love Looney Tunes. And like I said, to hear you do the voices at this moment right here with me, that blows me away that I had this opportunity uh, to hear that and be here with you doing that. But thank you so much for for this, man. And what what's coming up next for you? Well, look, you know, there is a Looney Tunes feature film. Aside from Coyote vs. Acme, there's another one that was in the works with Warner Brothers Animation, not like the the motion picture group. Uh, And uh, it's called The Day the Earth Blew Up, uh, a Looney Tunes movie. And um, it is fully animated. And it's in the style of like the Looney Tunes cartoons, uh, the one that you featured earlier with like Bugs and Marvin. Uh, and it was directed by Pete Browngart, uh, kind of co-directed and, and, and definitely exec produced by Alex Kerwan, Sam Register. Uh, and it's, I hope that that one gets some traction here. I know overseas and in, in uh, uh, Europe and Asia, I think it's going to do a theatrical run. Uh, and hopefully we get to see it here in any shape or form. Uh, and I think I think that might hopefully spark something for uh, Coyote versus for them to want to put out Coyote versus Acme. We'll see. So hopefully this is not the last time we talk to each other. Oh, well, I hope not. I hope I, I had that honor to talk to you again. It's been, it's, it's been great. So this man is busy. I don't want to take any more of his time. He's, he's, you know, it's, it's been nice of him to spend the time with me that he already has, but uh, Everyone, thank you for watching and supporting everything we do to make this interview possible. And you know what to do, people. Hit us up at kcoolmans at gmail.com. Look for this interview on Double Toasted Interviews, our YouTube channel. I'll probably be streaming it somewhere at some point, and who knows where else it'll be. But again, thank everybody, and stay toasty.